If there's one metric across Africa that gives many of its economies bragging rights, it's the who has the largest GDP metric. The last time Nigeria rebased its GDP in 2014, it found that the economy was 100% greater it moved from $250 billion to $500 billion than it had been reporting. The change pushed it ahead of South Africa to become the continent's largest economy. Nigeria's 2014 doubling of GDP was based primarily on the growth in two major sectors, according to experts, telecoms and banking. On the leaderboard today, however, Nigeria's GDP has since slipped to fourth place in Africa in USD terms and is just under $500 billion due to Naira devaluation. And according to the IMF, is set to fall further to $253 billion in 2024. Well, our guest today served on President Obama's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. He has over 35 years of pension fund and investment management experience in Africa and the US and runs a firm that has mobilized over $3.5 billion of investments into private equity in Africa. So it's fair to say he must know a, a thing or two about investing in the economy. Wale Adeoshun, founder and CEO of Karamo Capital Management, is passionate about Nigeria and Africa and is helping to drive catalytic commercial capital to fast-growing African businesses. He also believes there is a strong rationale, including emerging investment trends, for a rebasing of Nigeria's GDP. I certainly can't wait to hear what he has to say. Good morning, Mr. Adyoshan. Thanks for joining the show. So I guess my first question, in your recent report, you talked about the fact that Nigeria's GDP should be rebased to 1.5 trillion, which is actually $500 billion higher than even President Tinubu's plans <laughs> for the economy. What is driving this position? Well, very good. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Um, like you said, uh, the last time we rebased GDP, in uh, 2014 was based on two factors, the telecoms revolution and obviously the banking evolution. Since then, you can easily argue that we've had significant transformation of the Nigerian economy uh, from various sectors mm. uh, that should account for more than a 5x growth in the GDP of the, of the country. Uh, and I can elaborate on, on what those uh, sectors are, you know, if you would like me yeah, to. Yeah, of right course. Now. So the better view of you is 5X is five times the current number. Correct. So what are the factors that so, are driving this? Thank you. So, for example, uh, we've had a fintech revolution, uh, Relake. Um, and I think I was watching your earlier show and you touched on the unicorns. Uh, for the first time in Nigeria's history, we actually have unicorns. We have about seven of them. These are like more, uh, companies that have market cap. Uh, greater than a billion dollars that did not exist 10 years ago. So our lives have been transformed significantly by the fintech companies almost as equally as our lives were transformed by telecom revolution. That's huge to count, one. Uh, second one, obviously, is the industry that I work in, which is private equity and venture capital. Uh, there's been a wave of capital that has come in to fund private equity companies and venture com companies as well. So, for example, uh, when we started funding venture in, uh, in Nigeria in 2014, maybe we could count about $200 million that come into venture. Uh, today, over $2 billion has come in to fund various companies in the venture world. And like you said earlier too, uh, Karamo, we, we claim we've catalyzed over $3.5 billion to the economy. So that's huge growth, mm. uh, I think, in, of, 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 of capital that has come into the country to fund various companies and the value chain of those companies yeah. that haven't been captured uh, in the country so far. Then if you move on into um, what's going on in the remittances, right, Nigerians in the diaspora continue to remit funds back to the country. And you know, the fintechs have made it easier with improvements in the remittance uh, networks, right? And if, so if you count them, which numbers are maybe 20 billion, I claim it could be even higher. Okay, because as we high have, as what? Uh, it could be double that number, frankly, right? Because we have informal channels of remitting funds. I say every Nigerian on every plane that lands at the airport is carrying cash. And there's no way we can count that cash. So that informal uh, way of moving funds back is huge. Okay. And it contributes to the economy greatly, right? Mm. And then you count my favorite group, favorite area, which are the creatives, Okay. right? The creative sector in Nigeria has just expanded significantly since 2014. And that hasn't been captured fully. Yeah. So if you go from mm -hmm. the music to film to hospitality, uh, okay. and just the creative artworks, 
uh, those areas have to be captured. Somewhere. Yeah, and, and we'll talk about some of those sure. uh, innovative new sectors. But listening to all this, I'm asking myself, the ordinary man on the street, right. what do these figures actually mean right. in reality? Right. Um, and why are we not seeing the translation effect of all this money that's being pumped into the economy into sort of real consumption? Or are we purchasing power? You know, what's going on at the very micro level if this is really where we are as a country? We're, we're, I believe we're actually seeing it. Okay. Uh, we're seeing it. Uh, I believe that disposable income is way much higher, which is why we believe that the GDP must be higher. Okay, help, help me understand that. You say disposable <laughs> income is way more higher. Right. Bring back the layers for uh, us. Help us understand. Ab absolutely. If you look at the results of various companies in various sectors, uh, in 2023 results, most, a lot of companies had record revenues and record profit, right? And even you're seeing it in Q1 results as well. And you're seeing it in, not just in the banks, you're seeing it in some of the consumer companies. So the question we all keep on asking ourselves is, these consumer companies keep on increasing prices and keep, people keep on paying. So where, is the, where are the funds coming from? Where's the money coming from that enables people to keep on paying for increased prices? It must be a situation where the disposable income is much higher than we know or than we've been able to account so far. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of make sense of this, given the reality. So this, you say disposable income is higher, right. companies are doing profits. Are there certain spaces where you're seeing inelastic demand for essential? Because I, I think to myself, I need light, I need water, I need food. I need to pay for those items regardless of price. So is it concentrated in specific sectors? Well, I mean, I think you could say that, but the fact is some of those companies, you, you could make the argument that do you have to subscribe to some of those companies, right? If their prices are too high, do you have to have power 24-7, right? Do you have to keep on paying? Do you have to subscribe to some of the um, products of some of those companies or can you use substitutes, okay. right? Or can you go without them? But the fact that people are not doing that so far Right? We're not seeing these activities, people take this serious action, must suggest that there must still be some disposable income mm. for people to continue yeah. to be able to afford to, those prices. And, and that's interesting because at the top of my show, I don't know if you saw, I was reporting on the net losses that um, MultiChoice had suffered. Its Nigerian subscriber base was down by 1.2 million subscribers right. because of purchasing power. Right. Now, you could argue that subscription to pay TV is a luxury good, right? right? Because those uh, numbers have gone down. But I, but I just want to look at the inflows and investment inflows into the country, because that's a large part of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Where are the sectors that investors are seeing long-term opportunity and long-term growth in terms of putting capital right. for the long term? Good. So for us at Kuramo Capital, obviously, we focus on themes, right? So financial inclusion is a big one. And so we're seeing a lot of capital flowing into financial, uh, 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 financial companies, right? We've touched on the fintechs, and we, along that value chain, frankly, uh, financial services, we're seeing a lot of capital coming into that. Food security is another one. So agribusinesses are getting their share of mm -hmm. capital that's flowing through, and they're creating jobs, and that's really impactful uh, on, the, on, the, on the continent. Obviously, health, mm -hmm. um, healthcare. There's a lot of capital that's flowing into the country in the healthcare space, and we're investing in that space uh, tremendously. And I'm not sure all of this is really fully captured because we're in the private sector. Right. right? And unless we make announcements about these investments that we're making, you will not really not yeah. know. So, so essentially what you're saying is some of these private flows of money right. are not being captured in the overall GDP Absolutely. figures. So what are the solutions to help us capture Excellent. some of these flows? Excellent question. So it's one of the things where I, we really advocate that we really need a different um, approach uh, to measuring uh, the growth in our economies in Africa, particularly in, in Nigeria. I don't think most of the metrics that we're used to from mm -hmm. the West fully capture what's going on, right? So there should be a way where somehow we in the private sector are reporting our numbers of the, uh, of the country can capture the numbers of our transactions that are going on. The $3.5 billion we say we've catalyzed into the econ economy, I don't know how it's captured, frankly. Right? We fund businesses, but does anybody really record? But, but perhaps it's captured in the output of the businesses on the other end. That's one way to look at it. Yeah, some, some, some of that. But the mm. fact that that transaction also has value chains tied sure. to them, mm. are they fully really captured? You know, when we talk about FDI, does anybody know what IFDI is at Coromo Capital? 
I doubt that. Okay. Now, okay, so let's let's peel back the layers. I, I want us to stay on the GDP issue and we'll sort of make sense of that because even the UN, I know the UN Statistics, Statistics Commission recommends a rebasing every five years. Exactly. I know that the National Bureau of Statistics mentioned a couple of months ago that it was going to rebase both GDP and inflation. Right. Um, it did that with unemployment, I think, some months back. Right. But before we come to that, this private money that is going into these businesses that you right. say have resilient demand, right. Right. Um, what are the returns like? If I'm an investor today and I want to put my private capital into your fund, sure. first of all, what is investment horizon right. and what are the returns I'm likely to see? Especially given that exits, public capital markets, they're a bit illiquid to a large extent relative to other parts of the world. Yeah, you're correct. I mean, the public markets are not exactly uh, mm. the source of exits for private equity funds. Um, but in Africa, in Africa, for okay. the for most part, it's mostly trade sales okay. and, and, and sales to other private equity funds, the larger ones uh, that's happening, right? But in terms of um, of uh, of the term of our funds, it's typically long term, right? So we bring in long term money. People don't think we bring in long term money. But long it is. term by long term defined... means easily ten plus years, right? Okay. So you could have money ten plus one plus one, which okay. is almost twelve years, right? That you could bring capital into. And so it's patient capital. And a lot of the investors that come in may be pension funds, even endowment funds. Those are really long-term investors, right, that come through the country. So in terms of return expectations, though, obviously we're looking to at least make three times our money back in about seven years or a little higher than that, which kind of translates to like a 25% invest, uh, IRR uh, numbers. Okay. And in terms of the... Um sort of looking at private equity as a source of funding right. for companies versus right. other types of funding. What is the, the macroeconomic environment now in Nigeria with FX challenges, right. interest rates? How are some of those macroeconomic challenges shaping companies' ability to attract investment on the one hand and your ability to raise money right. from investors on the other hand? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of trying to uh, uh, identify investment opportunities, that continues. Okay. Right, this is a huge economy, really, and there are just several opportunities along those sectors that I described earlier, and that will continue uh, for a while. And in terms of attracting capital, I mean, I think, yes, the foreign exchange challenges, the volatility plays a role, but Nigeria is still a very attractive destination for a global CIO who has to allocate capital mm -hmm. uh, across regions of the world, right? We're one of the fastest growing regions of the world, Still, right, even though we may not be growing at four or five percent GDP right, growth rates, but we're still attractive uh, mm. to them. And so you still find folks coming through um, trying to find investment opportunities in that part of the world. Yesterday, you had the Rockefeller Foundation CEO in town. Last month, you had uh, Darren Walker, the, uh, the CEO of Ford Foundation in town. Uh, on Friday, after, uh, last week, Friday, you had another foundation from Ireland. So you still have investors continuing to look at Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in spite of our infrastructure challenges, uh, the, I think the, the disposable income and the power of our consumer is still very, 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 yeah. very powerful. So, so what I'm thinking, people. and, and I, I, wanna, I don't want to put you on the spot, but sure. I, I'm wondering if there's a, a difference in the way private capital behaves and capital that comes via public markets. Because I saw news mm. uh, day before years that BlackRock, right was looking at pulling out its ETF fund, which it has, uh, which gives it exposure to stock markets in Kenya, South Africa, and Nairobi, about 400 and something million dollars. True. And I'm wondering whether that's just because it's hot money, it's a bit more speculative. So you hear that type of news, but you also right. hear the type of news of investors still coming in and right. chasing the pot. So right. is it just different levels of appetite or is it just a different type of risk you know, framework that some of these investors are looking at Nigeria compared to the ones you are clearly doing business with? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's different goals that different investors have. I, mean, I think in the case of the BlackRock, uh, that's an index fund. And their challenge, obviously, is with the forex situation of the country. And obviously, it maybe affects the liquidity of the fund itself. Mm. So they have to remove the Nigeria from it, right? And so that affects the both. It's a public market. But private investors, frankly, um, still find the country very attractive uh, mm. as an investment destination, and they keep on coming. Uh, obviously, our demographics, we all know. That's yeah, a, that's, sure. That's great, and that, that will continue. And what you're finding right now is Nigerians, young Nigerians, right, are writing code and solving problems globally. And people are finding them because of it's the global world now. Mm. Right? And so people are looking for 
those young people and they're accepting them into the accelerators and the incubators of the world. Uh, and they're solving problems and continue get, receiving capital. Yeah. And it's private capital. And private capital is nascent in Nigeria, as you know. It's still evolving. Frankly, yeah. it's still evolving. Mm -hmm. But it's a different form of capital for companies. But it's growing really fast and much faster than people know. And we're creating companies much faster than people know. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not hearing the stories in our part of the world. But you're hearing the negative stories, stories more. Of course. Right? If we mm -hmm. tell you that Kuramo, like, we have exposure to over 250 companies, directly and indirectly, and the fact is about 80% of them didn't exist 10 years ago. Across Africa? Yeah, yeah. across Africa. Mm -hmm. And more than half of that in Nigeria. Right. But you've never heard that story mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Right? You know, you heard about the exits and about the companies leaving and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. But these are the next generation of companies that are coming up. Yeah, and they're and, growing and much faster than indeed. the older ones. And you make a, a very good point about right? us needing to sort of take back control about around the investment narrative. That Absolutely. is why we do what we do here on the rise. Yeah. We're trying to yeah. shape the narrative. But I, I want to ask you about a different um, asset class and group of uh, private capital, pension funds. Sure. Uh, our pension funds pot assets under management today is like 20 trillion in assets. And we've been right. talking about mobilizing this long term right. capital. Is right. that the type of capital that you think has the appetite to really help achieve these GDP growth figures through investment in, in local companies? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a huge source of, um, of capital for growth in the country and to create jobs, right? I mean, I think if you compare them to pension funds globally, focuses on capital preservation. Okay. So capital preservation really says that you want to ensure that your retirees, their livelihoods are maintained after they retire, mm -hmm. so that at least the investments can be at least close to inflation. Plus. And you're not taking on due risk. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But unfortunately, because of the investment um, and nature, the nascent nature of private equity right now, we're not seeing that in the um, pension funds. But we're seeing increasing appetite for venture and private equity and infrastructure investments from pension yeah, funds. From pension funds. Mm. And I think that's going to be the growth engine for the country, frankly, if mm. you ask me. Yeah. And we've seen that in developed markets. You were talking about um, Microsoft and Apple being the largest company in your, in your prior show. Most of those companies were funded by venture funds mm. in the U.S. And they're the largest companies in the U.S. today. Right. There's no reason why we can't have that in Nigeria as well, where most of our new companies that are coming up are funded by pension fund dollars, mm. right? And it helps growth in the economy, creates jobs, and also it helps the capital preservation for the retirees, yeah. where they can really, at least when they retire, mm. you know, they have enough funds to match inflation. And plus yeah, we definitely need to capture more into the sort of pension net because right. our dependency ratios are so low and we have the youthful demographics very... I want to touch on the creative economy. I'm Absolutely. not going to let you go because no, no, no. you've been singing the song Absolutely. for a very long time. <laughs> and everybody has been. And we have a minister for the creative economy and That's the true. arts and That's culture. True. That's true. This is, we're living a lot of value right. on the table, everybody says. Right. But can you even help us quantify, capture what that economy could mean mm -hmm. right. for Nigeria's GDP? Right. So I was talking to a lady yesterday, and she told me that the creative economy globally is about a trillion dollars uh, in terms of um, size, and Nigeria is maybe 2%. I think she went up as high as 3%. I suspect probably even lower. Mm. And so if you think that we are now really super global, right, so it's not just African continent. This is really global. The creative arts folks have done an amazing job for us. Uh, in terms of uh, risk perception, right? I'm lowering the risk perception for, for sure. Africa overall. Uh, and so you should think they should be able to capture at least close to 20, 30% of that trillion, mm -hmm. right? And so more work needs to be done in terms of funding them. I mean, we've seen an example, right? I, I recall, I want to say maybe seven, eight years ago, the one gentleman in DC that invested in, uh, in Maven Records introduced me to Jan Don Jazzy. And then now this year, you saw the exit right. of almost $125 million in terms of valuation or whatever that number is. There should be more of those mm. that happen, and there should be more investments in that space. And I think we're, all, we're looking at that space very, very uh, actively mm. right now. And I think monetizing and capturing uh, the value chain that comes along with that industry is very, very critical uh, yeah. to the success of the country. And do you have... Uh 
companies in that space in your portfolio? We have a few companies in our okay. portfolio, not enough. Music, art, uh, we have, film. We have, we have some art. We're okay. working on some on a, on a film fund, uh, uh, in, and uh, and I think we push, we're going to do more. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. This is a very interesting discussion. You know, on, on the rebasing of the GDP, I'm sure a lot of people will come back with sure. comments around this. I know because when we talk to foreign investors right. and we tell them about the government's plan, that $1 trillion economy is on the forefront of their minds. But you are saying the potential is actually much, <laughs> much bigger. And, and I think the final thing is really just to say, how can we make that GDP count for the ordinary Nigerian? So that's a, that's a bigger challenge, right? And, and that's, that's the growth. Um, obviously, it, I think it also has to do with our understanding of, the, of our economy mm. uh, really well and the linkages and our policies, right? I think if we do a better job of understanding those linkages, we can have programs targeted mm -hmm. uh, to the right people. Right. Because I'm not sure we truly understand, you know, some people say we don't have a middle class, which I disagree with. All this disposable income can be coming from just the one percent or the five percent, if you say. Yeah. So there's a group in the middle there that can afford more, but I'm sure there's a group that's also struggling. Mm. So we need targeted policies to that group, but yeah. we have to identify them uh, going forward. Yeah, fantastic. It's been so great speaking to you. Absolutely. I'm sure I'd love to sort of come back, mm. and especially if we get a rebasing of our GDP, Absolutely. to sort of look at these issues again. So great to be speaking to. Uh, Mr. Wale Adioshin, founder and CEO of Karamo Capital Management on our show. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for in Business Week. I'm Rola K. Akinkube Filani. Let's continue the conversation on X, of course. Do have a lovely rest of the weekend. See you next time.